everyone. Letitia and I are going to a new creek today. Let's see what, what it's about. Can't pick up a point or two in there. This is a big nice creek. Hopefully we'll have some luck here. Got the rubber boots on again today. And the first couple steps, water went right in both feet, so I'm already wet. I'm ready to find a point. All right, we've been in this creek for a while. We haven't even seen a flake of flint. There's Letitia back there. She's got a lot of rock to walk through. So the one good thing is no human footprints, only raccoon, deer, and bobcat. And honestly, I'm just about ready to give up on this creek when I saw this. Can you guys see that? Long way to go. Where to go? I lost it. Well, Look like a point. Hold on just a minute, I'm gonna have to refine this this whatever it is, I'll refine it. Okay, there it is. Definitely flint. Definitely something. I don't know if it's whole or not. So, let's find out. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice little point. Still, we've got the needle, needle point on it and everything. Not bad, gives me hope to keep going. We were just about ready to get out of here and find another creek. I think we'll keep going now. Okay, I'll show Letitia when she gets up here, I'm not gonna make her hurry up through all that rock, so. All right, we'll keep going. Okay, about 10 minutes later, since my last check-in with you guys, Letitia's still way down there. She decided to go explore a little feeder creek off to the right. And I just walked up on this. My second point of the day. 
Can you guys see that right there? Take a picture of that. This one's laying right up on top. Looks like a whole point. Nothing spectacular, but. I'll take it all day long. Nice little, looks like a woodland point. Perfect. Very well used. Nice. Okay, that's point number two for me and Letitia. As far as I know, hasn't found anything. Which is totally a reversal of how it's been the last few times. So, maybe I can keep my luck up. Here we go. What'd you find, baby? All right, we've so done we reverse directions. Now we're coming downstream. All right, what you, what you got there? Right oh, from goodness. right here from the bridge. Sorry, I didn't have it on live action, but I didn't. And I apologize. Look at that, baby. Oh my goodness! Oh wow! Crazy! Can you pick it up? Yes, you can. Pick Man, that would have been a huge that would have, blade. Would have been a huge blade. G10 quality. Oh my goodness, honey. Careful. These rocks are really, really slippery. Wow. What do you think that would have been? Huh. Spear point. Definitely a huge one. Oh, it's harder. Well, we walked and walked and walked and haven't found anything else other than this nutting stone, which is pretty cool. Carrying that back out for Letitia. She likes to keep these, so. Definitely putting this creek down as a good one on the map. Uh, two whole points and Letitia's broken one which would have been a find of a lifetime if it had been whole. So thanks guys for coming on this little creek walk with us today and hope you guys had fun and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Hello guys, welcome to the channel. Nice to see you here. Uh, doing things a little bit different today. Filming this inside, even though it's a beautiful day outside. Uh, have a very important share for you guys and I don't want anybody complaining that they can't hear the audio. So before we get started, uh, this platform unfortunately is engaged in some pretty shady business practices. They're uh, unsubscribing, arbitrarily unsubscribing people that have subscribed to the channel. So if you're a returning subscriber, please look and make sure that you're still subscribed. 
and uh, you might have to do that with all your favorite channels because I'm not the only one this is happening to. Uh, the algorithm and the people that are running this platform are against truth tellers like myself. While the creepypasta channels and BS channels, you know, fictional channels, make they're making uh, lots of money being really successful but people like me are not having that kind of luck here so I tell truth on this channel I'm not here to blow smoke up anyone's ass for clicks so if you value truth over fiction reality over make-believe you're in the right place be sure and like and subscribe to this video uh, be sure and like and subscribe and, and maybe leave a comment or share with the people that you know would be inter interested in this so uh, a couple of months ago I, I got a letter in the mail a four page letter from an actual scientist that's been working uh, doing field biology research down in the land between the lakes national recreation area for 40 years he's been waiting 20 years to talk to me he was under funding and couldn't speak about things of this nature, but now he's not. And he sent me this letter, and I want to share it with you guys. Uh, everybody wants answers when it comes to the LBL. I know I've been looking for answers down there for over 15 years now, and I've, I've never been able to get any answers at all or even any confirmation of what I thought might be going on there. Uh, until now so I hope you guys enjoy this like I said it's, it comes from an actual scientist uh, with, and I've been talking to this guy for two months and I can tell you right now he is the most qualified witness that I've ever spoken to so having said that I want to just go ahead and read you this letter and then we can talk about a little bit of it uh, after I get done and what it exactly does it mean Okay, December 12, 2022, hello Mr. Nunley. Some years ago you reached out to me regarding an encounter I had in Mammoth Cave National Park back in 2005. At the time I was involved in grant funded research for several state universities and could not get involved with anything along the lines of, of a cryptic nature. I have since parted ways with these institutions and I am free to communicate with you should you like. So I will discuss in this letter some personal observations regarding LBL as well as my creature sighting in South Central Kentucky from 2005. A little backstory on me, I'm a wildlife photographer and naturalist with a lifelong passion for flora and fauna of the Southwest. I've done research in LBL since the 1980s, but I've been going there as a child as far back as 1970s with my parents. The annual LBL Eagle Weekend was always a draw for my mother, father, and me. Recently, I listened to a podcast of an interview between you and the Henderson family, father and son, and a man named Roger. I was impressed with your line of questioning. I thought both Hendersons asked solid questions about said creature attack from the early 1980s in LBL. I found Roger to be very believable and forthright. This attack I had heard about many years ago, but never really knew what to make of it. So I just put it in the safe recesses of my mind. And I questioned him, he heard about this in the 1990s. And I'm almost sure that Jan Thompson did not publish any of her stories about this uh, particular attack until after the year 2000. So this is, right here is confirmation that that story was around a lot longer than Jan Thompson, uh, long before she wrote it down. And I'll, I've also talked to several other people uh, that can confirm that as well. So the story predates Jan Thompson. So for the record, I should tell you that in all my years of research in LBL, I have never come across a dog man, and I pray to God I never do. That said, I usually carry into the woods bear mace on my belt. I know personally two people whose family members did experience encounters with a creature described as such. 
but one of these was from many years ago, probably in the late 1950s, just before the government took the land from the people. It was actually in 1948. Uh, I contacted this witness that he's talking about. So through him, I've been able to document the earliest uh, sighting of the dog man in the LBL, which was 15 years before the presence of the government there. So, make of that what you will. Man, okay, one of these encounters occurred in what was then known as Golden Pond and the other further south, but on the same side of the Cumberland River. This creature was known in the land between the rivers as the beast and nothing more. I don't believe it was ever described as John Landis's iconic silver screen werewolf. And the term dogman is a very recent term that I've only heard in the last 10 years or so. And uh, after speaking to the witness this man provided me, it turns out that it was called a werewolf by this lady's grandfather. And he used to uh, scare her with stories and tell her not to go outside after dark or the werewolf would get her. So you have to remember this letter is two months old now and um, I've learned some things both from him and the other witnesses that he's provided uh, that he didn't know. So, the fauna of LBL has changed significantly over the last 50 years. Coyotes migrated into Kentucky in the late 1970s. Nine banded armadillos in the 1990s. White pelicans, the second largest avian, avian in North America, only the condors larger, began arriving there seasonally in 2000 and even several badger sightings have been reported. With exception of the dangerous feral hogs, all of these are natural movements and normal of animals to migrate and colonize new territory. It's what they do, what they've always done. There are also what I believe to be red wolves still hanging on in the LBL and likely hybridizing with coyotes. Panthers have also been seen in the region, including land between the lakes, in 1989, I had a large panther cross the road in front of my car near Skunk Hollow. Excuse me. There's no mistaking an eight-foot-long cat in broad daylight, so you never really know what you might encounter there. Confirmation of panthers and wolves in LBL from a scientist right here. I have had on many occasions interactions with what I believe are Bigfoot in LBL. These have involved having objects thrown through the window, the open window of my moving vehicle during the night as I traveled. These objects have included small, unopened, short-leaf pine cones and white and red oak acorns. Always small, never rocks, never anything large to hurt me, just more or less trying to get a raise out of me, perhaps. But that said, the impact sound of a small acorn makes when it comes flying into a vehicle traveling 35 miles per hour uh, and smacks into your dashboard sounds like a firecracker going off in front of you. I'm sure uh, it will get your attention. Through the late 1980s and into the early 2000s, I would find odd structures all about the forest of LBL. I had no idea what they were. The structures I knew were not built by random hikers as they were just in such odd placement and nowhere near a trail or footpath and often quite deep in the forest. For years I was perplexed by what they were, as well as who created them, and then around 2001 I came across the late Mary Green's website, Tennessee Bigfoot Lady. I heard you mention her name in your interview with the Hendersons, I believe, and that is another reason of me making, another reason of making me feel at ease about reaching out to you. Those structures I was finding in LBL were identical to what Mary had photographed in her native Overton County, Tennessee. Yes, Mary and I were really good friends. I loved her dearly and miss her. Continuing on, Mary and I would become pen pals. She was particularly interested in some of the photos taken from one of my research sites in LBL. They were, for lack of a better description, small teepee types structures. The intricate manner in which they were constructed to this day, I have no explanation. Myself and another field biologist tried to duplicate the manner of construction with similar sized branches of sumac, post, and white oak 
and we were unable to do so. Those pictures were on her website for many years, but I lost the originals, and sadly, when I went to her website some years ago, I read that it was no longer active. Further reading, I found her obituary. I was very sad. I was sad that I never got to meet her, me too, despite her many invites to Overton County to join her group in their endeavor to reveal more about this creature we call Bigfoot. I'm right there with you, man. Very sad that I never got to meet this lady. In October of 1999, TVA turned control of LBL over to the United States Department of Agriculture. For the record, let me state that I believe the USDA's Division of Forestry is very much aware of the activity that has taken place in LBL over the last 50 years involving these cryptids. There is no doubt they have covered this up. I base this upon many things, but mostly my personal interactions with law enforcement in LBL over the years. At a particular research site where I had found all the structures, I would be randomly stopped on roads and asked questions that were pointless and non-fact-finding. This happened on many occasions. It got to the point that I felt unsafe through intimidation. Even though this section of LBL was not restricted, there are some areas that are, and even though I had a scientific research permit to be there, despite that, the harassment became more than I wanted to deal with. So if you think uh, they won't run you off there, you're wrong. They'll run a scientist off there with permission to be there, permits and a mission. So they won't have any problems running you off if they catch you in these particular spots. These interactions were bizarre to say the least and happened in some of the most remote areas of LBL. They would show up seemingly from nowhere and stop my vehicle on the gravel roads. Usually two vehicles, but one time three. They knew who I was, they knew my research, and yet they would search my car. It was a force of repetitive intimidation and nothing more. They did not want me there plain and simple. I finally figured out that they had cameras all along those roads. Monitoring what? Me? Cryptids? Have you ever read the SD, USDA's mission statement for LBL? It is an entirely hands-off approach, basically not managing any of the forest proper. The canopy has gotten so thick in places that it is preventing the sunlight from penetrating the forest floor. For more specialized species of flora and fauna, this can be a death sentence. In the 1960s, LBL was 80% forested. Today, it is now 95%. This has significantly depleted certain species of flora and fauna that depend on native grasslands, or what I refer as species requiring mediation zones between field and forest. What the public is hearing from the LBL handlers is that all is good and well, but nothing could be further from the truth. The budget going into last year was zero. In the Last 20 years, they have shut down campgrounds, closed off certain trails, gated more roads than I can mention, reduced quota for deer hunting, etc. It's certainly not the place I remember only 20 years ago, but things do change. In 2017, both EHD, which is epizootic hemorrhagic disease, and CWD, chronic waste disease, were found in LBL's white deer populations thus reducing an already severely declining game species. Interestingly enough, in that same year, large black and brown feral hogs began to show up all across LBL and Stewart and Trigg counties. What are the chances of that? Swine are resistant to many viruses and other diseases. They are hardy and tough to kill, but if you're an apex predator and your primary food source is dwindling with rot and disease, then a mass-producing hog population was an answer to this problem. Think about that. Those hogs were put there purposefully, and it was well orchestrated by the shadow management of LBL. The traps they have placed throughout the peninsula are nothing more than PR semantics. Most of the time, the, those traps are not even set. They just lie dormant. No trigger, no bait, no hogs. One of the head biologists at LBL once told me in a phone conversation that they were thinking about shooting these feral hogs from a helicopter. 
unless the government has magic bullets that can bend around trees, that just is not going to happen. Honey hogs from the air in East Texas and chasing them through open fields is not quite the same as attempting this in an area that is 95% oak hickory and coniferous forests. In 2014, LBL biologists proposed the Pigs Gob Bay Native Grassland Project. Look this up online if you get a moment. This would have taken 4,000 acres of oak hickory forest and converted them to open fields. This would have been maintained with prescribed burns via USFS, United States Forestry Service got such scrutiny from ecological groups that they eventually canceled the proposal. If you're not familiar with Pigs Gob Bay, look it up on the topo map for LBL. There are 170,000 acres in LBL. Why that location for said project? If you create these open areas for both white-tailed deer and feral hogs, then their numbers should go up, or at least in that specific area of LBL. If you're a large predatory animal that, feed, that needs to feed often, then this might have been the reason. Understand that I have absolutely no proof of this, but too much of what I've seen out there in the last four decades leaves me with more questions than answers. I believe the entire LBL Peninsula has tunnels running beneath its surface. I have secondhand knowledge of tunnels built underneath a nearby regional military base which I would guess would be Fort Campbell. And on many occasions I have heard blasting shots followed by subterranean drilling under my feet while doing research in LBL. As a younger man, I worked as a coal miner in the Western coal fields. I am familiar with blasting and subterranean hydraulic drilling rigs. The percussive sounds from these detonations in LBL were, was more intense than anything I've ever heard in those Western Kentucky coal mines. The distance from the military base to LBL is approximately 30 miles, and I know firsthand of subterranean tunnels just across the Kentucky Lake in Callaway County, Kentucky. There's a location there that if you are parked along the road, you can actually hear vehicles moving below the earth. If you're there too long, you will be met by armed men in camo, devoid of insignia. They will ask you what you are doing. Keep in mind this is a public road. That said, it is continuously monitored by cameras, so I'm thinking the entire area is a network of tunnels. But as for their purpose, I have no idea. This is not a stretch. If engineers can build tunnels under the Atlantic Ocean, has been, as has been well documented, then constructing tunnels under the Tennessee Cum and Cumberland Rivers would certainly be plausible. So here we have uh, confirmation of underground activity going on at the LBL. And that's uh, one of the things that everyone uh, has been guessing about and, and postulating about what could be going on underground there. Continuing, the light of LBL as we named it back in the 1980s is another mystery that to this day I have no idea of its source, purpose, or intention. But if you spend enough time out there you will see it. It is a very bright light that may appear to most as nothing more than the star low on the horizon, Venus or Mars. Bright it is, but always low, and often remaining just above the treetops. And if you approach it too closely, it simply sinks below the forest out of view. It seems to possess a playful intelligence, and I'm certain of that. I've seen it rise and fall, only to rise again in the exact place an hour later. I've also seen flying objects out there over the years that were huge and without sound, but they have been random and never consistent as is this light. So here we go, confirmation of UFO activity, unidentified aerial phenomenon going on right there in LBL, which has been reported by many over the years. Some of the cemeteries out there are packed with energy. If you take an EMF reader to certain ones, it is mind blowing but night it is the time. Energy orbs also, day or night. No idea what those really are though. I find orbs fascinating and non-threatening. Actually, I feel they are a positive energy, but that is just my observation. I don't really have much more to say about LBL. It is a very special place in my heart and mind, and I guess I've devoted my lifetime to its research. There are places out there I can trek into and not see another human being for days should I want. 
which is perfect, but it is a solitude one must respect. And finally, about my creature sighting at Mammoth Cave in May 2005, I will call it Bigfoot simply because I don't really know what else to call it. And what I saw conforms to that conventional description by others, I guess. So I'll just go with that. One late evening in May of 2005, I was walking a familiar trail within the, within the 50,000 acre Mammoth Cave Park proper when a disturbance at trailside captured my attention. It was a pounding sound on the ground. I gave it only passing attention though because my gaze was most focused upon the trail that I was trekking. It was the first wave of warm human air of the season and copperheads and other pit vipers go from diurnal to nocturnal activity and often crawl into these open areas. Yeah, they, they do. The pounding of the ground at trailside I had experienced before with deer. If feeling threatened, they will stomp the ground sometimes just before running. So really, I expected it was just a white-tailed deer and nothing more. But then this bipedal creature comes running across the trail approximately 50 feet in front of me. I got a really good look at it, but only for a few seconds before it vanished into the darkening forest. It was maybe six to six and a half feet tall. I can't say exactly because we were not on level ground as I was descending a slight hill. It was skinny, almost emaciated looking actually. Keep in mind, I'm only seeing it from its profile and not head on. The head seemed smallish for its body with no noticeable neck, no tail. Its legs and arms seemed proportional in length for its body when comparing it to a man, I guess. But its thick legs were quite impressive and large in comparison to its skinny body, if that makes any sense. It was covered in short tannish hair or fur I guess that its weight would have to be around 350 to 400 pounds, but I could be way off on that. Likely it was no less than that and probably more. It took short steps across the trail as it ran. It ran with intent and it ran like a man, not long strides. The sound its feet made as it ran across the karst ground was pounding that only a very large densely boned and muscled creature could make almost as if, it's its legs, as if its legs were made from concrete. As it crossed into the forest, the crashing and breaking of large tree branches resonated through the otherwise quiet air, and then it was gone. There was no vocalization and no foul scent, nothing more. I had a long walk back to my vehicle, it seemed like forever, as the sun sank below the forest. And just knowing the creature was out there, well, I was scared. And I'm not afraid to admit that either. This trail has very little foot traffic that late in the day and I believe I surprised this creature. This creature may have been proportioned to a man and even ran like such, but make no mistake, this was no man and it was wild as anything I've ever encountered in my journeys and I want that to be clear. I went back to this location the following morning armed with a pistol because I wanted to see if it had left any footprints the reason being, the area it traversed was lower and slightly damp with a nearby seep spring and the karst clay soils might have captured its impact, I was thinking, but to my great disappointment, there was nothing there. I returned to this area many times over the last two decades and will not have seen the creature again and have not seen the creature again, but I have experienced what others refer to as wood knocks. They sound like the cracking of a gunshot going off and are very often very close by. The purpose behind them I do not know, but when I return to the area each spring, I often experience a wood knock and sometimes two. Last spring, I heard two within five minutes of each other. I don't feel threatened by them, but I respect their boundaries and don't push into those specific areas. Keep up the great work, my friend, and be safe out there. You're an amazing researcher and artist. Combining the two is a rare blessing. Stay safe, your new friend. Okay, so that's the end of the letter. As you see, it was uh, quite the letter. And as you imagine, might imagine, it uh, sparked quite the conversation between me and the scientist who wrote that letter.
Okay, so I want to thank this kind gentleman for uh, reaching out to me and standing up and sharing the, the knowledge that he has pertaining to the LBL area. You know, a lot of people they have uh, in humanoid encounters, uh, it changes their whole worldview, their paradigm shifts. Uh, they're often left scared and confused, not knowing what to do. Well, I'll tell you what to do. You stand up like this man did, and you tell the truth. Knowledge is power, and this is the only way that we're going to ever understand anything that's going on in our world, because all these things are being kept hidden from us by the powers that be. So if you have a, if you have a strange sighting of something like that, please don't be silent. That's what they want you to do. Stand up and tell the world what you know, and that way... You're helping people and not contributing to the narrative that's being force-fed down people's throats. And this man, uh, like I said, I've been talking to him on the phone and through text for two months now. And he asked me, he said, Bart, are you sure you want to do this? Uh, because some of, the, some of it's uh, pretty sensational and there are powers that be out there that do not want this knowledge uh, to become public so I was I was speaking to another one of my friends a really good friend of mine named Larry Fisher about uh, our national parks being ceded to United Nations for the uh, management and control the UN and I don't know how well that sets with you but having foreign troops on our soil in our national parks doesn't sit too well with me and uh, this other fellow was telling me how uh, these white vans are being seen all over our national parks uh, with barcode and US government license plates and I thought well if anyone knows if that's true or not uh, it's my buddy here my new scientist friend and so I asked him uh, have you ever seen white vans in the park there? And he's given me permission to share uh, the info that he's sent me via text message. His answer to that question was yes. I've seen many contractors and with U.S. government plates. They're a common sight for me. I watch from afar and I don't engage but I see them the most along hilltops when trees are bare and I'm shed hunting in the lower pans and fields start usually mid-February. They are a common sight. They are not TVA. I often see them along such and such road. He's asked me not to uh, name, the, name the exact locations of these, these uh, government troops that they, they frequent. So I won't do that. So, let's just say that uh, it's near Devil's Backbone in the South End. Um, and Wrangler's Loop. So these and a few other places are heavily monitored, monitored with cameras. He says, I know much of what I see out on the ground and in the air is government, whether military maneuvers or otherwise. They are present. I pay more attention to the plates, but I know they are white and say U.S. government. Right now, you'll see white bands with anywhere from 10 to 12 soldiers in camo on marching treks through LBL. These soldiers are from Fort Campbell, maybe. Uh, they will have blue guns. What that is, is a training weapon to simulate weight and feel of actual M4s. This is a hard rubberized gun. You see these men on long hikes up and down Red Hollow often in Trigg County. They will avoid eye contact and conversation, but often do not have what I would call a military style haircut. Are all of them from the 101st or is this something else? There's a lot there maybe. Um, so again we have confirmation of government 
vans congregating in uh, our national parks. And what they're doing there and what their mission is, we don't know. Uh, but some people think that once these UN troops are activated, they will all the vans and they don't allow you to fly drones in the parks anymore. And a lot of people speculate that's because they have these huge parking lots where these van, these white vans are parked. So a lot of people speculate that when they're actually activated, these foreign troops will come out of the parks in these vans and start rounding people up and putting them in camps, if not shooting them. And the reason being is because foreign troops will have no qualms about um, firing on innocent American citizens. So, as you can see, this touches on a, a really sensitive topic, um, probably relating to national security or the plans that these people are making for the American people. And this is why the people who are in charge of this, the powers that be, the elite who control our country, they don't want truth tellers like me out here telling you these things. So, but I always tell people that the only thing that they can do is to stand up and tell the truth. And that's what this man did. And so that's what I have to do regardless of the consequences. So if you guys, if you would uh, say a prayer for me and Letitia, that these people don't uh, harm us or put us in prison unjustly. So, of course, I had questions for the for this man, and um, I asked him every question that I had, and he answered without hesitation. Uh, this man is exactly what he claims to be. Uh, and I have to tell you that this this letter that I just wrote uh, read you was not the original letter. Uh, the original letter contained names, dates, and specific locations of all, all of this man's claims. And uh, I thought it would be better and maybe a little bit safer if he would retype the letter and taking out all the names and the locations that he didn't want me to share. And that's what he did. Now he mailed the letter, the replacement letter on December 18th, I'm sorry, January 18th, and the letter did not uh, did not make it to my house for over two weeks later. And this man lives in Tennessee, roughly three hours from my house. And I got the, repl the replacement letter, the first one. I think it was uh, February 3rd, and the very next day, the letter that, the very first replacement letter that he sent out arrived. There it is right there. I haven't done anything with it. Uh, it's obviously been opened. I don't know if you can see that. So I have not opened the letter myself. I'm going to take this letter out and burn it today because I really don't see anything positive that can come from me opening this first repla replacement letter. It seems a little thicker than the other one and there could be something in there that I don't want to touch or be around and uh, or it could be a note from whoever uh, saying shut up. So I don't, if it is I don't want to read it and it, it wouldn't matter anyway. I'm not shutting up and I'm doing what I, I tell everyone else to do, stand up and, and tell the truth. So, of course, you know, lots of questions for this man, and like I say, he answered them every, every one, and uh, he asked me to send him one of my books, which I did, and I also sent him a copy of Martin Grove's book, Beast Between the Rivers, which he left me a few copies when we all got together here at my house last Labor Day. So his reaction to the book was, I'll read it to you right here. It's, per it's pertinent because he has more information. He said, Bart, my girlfriend read to me out loud earlier Martin's book. 
we read to each other sometimes. It was a quick read, and that's why we tackled it first. Thank you so much for these books. They're great drawings, Bart, and I think Elijah Henderson had a few as well. Interesting testimony. Very sad about Martin's friend Harry and his death in 2017. I'm gathering no pictures were ever taken of the claw damage on Harry's Dodge truck. He also mentioned that the area was basically shut down shortly thereafter, just like the area up in Lyon County in 1982. That is what they do, Bart. Same thing at Cedar Point in late 1980s. There was a reported death of a camper up there, but it was just told to me by a guy who ran Skunk Hollow Campground, and then they shut it down. This was one of the most beautiful places in LBL. I go up there once a year just to look across Kentucky Lake and take pictures of my wildflowers. But I armed myself on that walk and not with bear mace. The law enforcement did not want anyone going out there or crossing the gated road. And I'll tell you more about that another day. And I asked him again if he knew anyone who has uh, seen the Beast of LBL, and he told me about this lady. Uh, his answer was, yes, I have. One was a buddy, and it was his father. I've lost track of him over the many years, but the other one is a close friend of mine, and it was her mother who is still alive. You might be able to talk to her directly. She'd be in her 80s now. They were driving in LBL, which is land between the rivers. Uh, that's what it was known before. Kennedy took over and uh, now it's known as land between the lakes so she uh, they were driving an LBL it was in those days before it was taken over by Kennedy they came around a curb on a gravel road and the beast was in the middle of the road her husband was driving which is this woman's grandfather and he hit the brakes so hard that it threw this girl's mother who was sitting in the back passenger side near door it he hit the brakes so hard that it threw uh, threw her out of the car and she received so much damage to her head that she had to have a steel plate put in and to this day she has it. I believe these creatures are real and physical but or but are cowardly yet cunning. I think they attack the weak and women often. And is it possible their eyes, what they see and who they see can record these events in real time to their waiting handlers, perhaps from underground from whence they may be being held and released. It would explain how they are so immediately recovered, like the example you told of the man in Michigan. So here we have a confirmation by a scientist of another killing uh, that took place and was covered up. So everywhere I look, I'm getting more and more uh, stories about people who've been attacked or killed in LBL. So, of course, I had to get the number of the daughter of the woman who was thrown out of the car. And her name is S Ether Tucker. And she said it was okay for me to, to say her name. And she told me that uh, her grandpa was driving in the summer of 1948 down Colson Hollow Road near Golden Pond. Her grandmother is 84 now, and she was nine years old when it happened. I did ask to speak to the grandmother directly, or to the, to the mother directly, but uh, she was unable to do so because of her injuries, which have been uh, steadily getting worse over the years, and now it's at a point where uh, she struggles to remember things and to speak, so I had to speak to her daughter. And... Esther told me that her granddad, uh, whose name Ramey Elvis Colson, he always told her stories about uh, the monster of LBL. And he always told her not to go out after dark because the werewolf would get her. And when I asked about details of the incident regarding her mother, she said, the thing standing in the road was seven to eight foot tall, standing on its hind, hind legs, uh, and it had a wolf, wolf head. So uh, her granddad had to stomp on the brakes, brakes so hard, her mother flew out of the car. 
uh, hit her head on the road, crushed her skull, and had to have a metal plate put in her head, which is still there. And like I say, this is the earliest uh, sighting of the Beast of LBL that I've ever ever read or, or, or heard or taken myself. And uh, he told her that uh, he used to tell her stories about campers going up in there and being and becoming missing in, in the LBL woods and finding nothing but bloody torn clothes and stuff like that. And uh, her mother went on to be, to become a successful microbiologist, but couldn't function uh, after the head trauma. She was never quite right. So. Here we have there are also the earliest case of someone suffering a physical injury indirectly caused by this creature. Another interesting thing that she told me was that in 2021, her and a friend were going across the bridges going into LBL. They saw some UFOs hanging over the water. Uh, at least 20 lights, she said, vertical lights. Uh, was just hanging over the water there. And by the time they reached the next bridge, there was only three. So she thinks probably that they went down into the water. So, and she also has friends in law enforcement who have warned her over and over again not to go into the LBL unarmed. As a matter of fact, they tell her never go in there, uh, especially at night stay away from the LBL and that's when she pressed for more information they would not speak of it any further other than to say it's important not to go there night or day so we have a lot of uh, a lot of confirmation about what's been going on down there and really it's it's quite sensational that the things that this man has, has told me and like I said he is the uh, the most qualified witness that I've ever spoken to in my life uh, I've spoken to a lot of credible witnesses uh, probably the most credible that I've ever spoken to would be Martin Groves but this man here is the most qualified as a scientist uh, that I, most qualified witness I've ever spoken to and uh, I'm sure that he doesn't want any anything to come of this other than to share what he knows. He doesn't want his name uh, put out there. He doesn't want anything but to tell the truth, and I applaud this man for that. And uh, there's just been so much. I have so so many so many messages to read to you guys that have. Uh, concerning the LBL from other people and I'm going to get to that in my very next video. I'm sorry I'm, I'm way behind on reading the emails that people have sent in. I really appreciate you sending them in. Um, as long as they're truth and not fiction. Uh, I don't do any fiction here. I don't care anything about that. I just want to tell people the truth so they can know what's going on. And um, It's Sometimes it's very hard. I've had a few people uh, tell me that they, they want to help the channel. If you do, if you want to help the channel, because uh, I'm not making any money, uh, we're, I'm being shadow banned, uh, cut off from the point of making any money from this. So it's really right now just a labor of love to tell you guys the truth about what's going on. But if you'd like to help the channel, please hit the super thanks or... Uh, had someone ask for my PayPal address and I'll drop that in the description box. So if you want to support the channel that way, we would really appreciate it. Uh, we need all the help we can get here and especially prayers. So I'm going to sign off for now. Thank you guys for listening to me. I hope this has cleared up a lot of the, the uh, rumors that's been going around about the LBL. Uh, now we have scientific verification of a lot of what's going on there. So if you guys have enjoyed this content, please hit the like button and consider subscribing. 
and maybe even sharing or leaving a comment. Everything helps. Uh, the algorithm, like I said, is dead set against people like me. So any help you can give us would be appreciated. Uh, thanks for stopping by. Thanks for watching this video. And until the next time, you guys be safe. And we'll be seeing you uh, probably sometime soon up, up a creek somewhere. Okay, have a great day. Thank you, guys.